All right, so my name is Peter Chesson. I'm here to talk to you about today about a journey that I took my company on. So if you read my bio, uh, I've worked at Veracode for a very long time, and I've seen a lot of stuff, and I've gotten to do a lot of stuff in, in the, that one context. So I've been a software developer 25-plus uh, years, a lot, of, a lot of time in the security industry, um, done a lot of Agile, and like I said, at Veracode, I've been able to go from monolith to microservice and from waterfall to DevOps. And I want to share with you that story because I think there's a lot of lessons in there. Not everyone's journey is going to be the same, but a lot of the things that we had to worry about, you're going to have to worry about. Uh, also, if you ever want to talk to me, get me down for whiskey and you'll have my attention all night. Uh, quick show of hands, uh, developers in the audience. Okay. Uh, security. Quality. What I miss? Operations. All right, couple. All right. Uh, look, we're going to talk about the drivers for the transformation. Uh, and a lot of talks talk about tooling. I want to talk about this from people, process, technology. The last talk from, uh, from the HP folks did a great job of talking about some of those things. I don't agree with a lot of things that they said. My journey was different, but that's okay. Uh, I would talk specifically about the journey that, that I was on and what we're still struggling with today. So we started at, Ver at Veracode in 2006. Um, now, we were in a, a waterfall shop. Who, who's doing at waterfall right now? Anyone? All right, so we can skip through that pretty good. A couple people. All right, uh, how about Agile? All right, how about full-on DevOps? Okay, who's, who's interested in starting the journey? Is that why you're here? Yeah, excellent. So that six-year gap is going to be important. Uh, we're going to talk about that uh, a couple times in the presentation. Uh, in 2013, this is kind of my foray into talking outside of the company. We did a, a project called Purina, where I talk about using our product to secure our product. Uh, so that's really what started me down this road of being a, a practitioner who also likes to go out and talk to people about that experience. And then, uh, obviously, microservices and, and our transformation into DevOps. Okay, so people, people part of this process felt like this. When I sat down and did this presentation, I'm like, yeah, this is perfect. Um, it was a roller coaster. There's constant change in the company when we moved from that waterfall to uh, our DevOps transformation. The kinds of things that we had to do in the organization, and from two perspectives, who's a manager in the room? Okay, all right. So this this will apply to you. Uh, from a management point of view, um, you're leading change. That's the critical part here. Helping people understand why you're doing things, why you're changing the way they've done business typically. Uh, and unfortunately, there's going to be some hard conversations that you're going to have to have. Organizationally now, as we break down silos, so some people choose not to break them down. We chose to break them all down. As you're breaking down those silos, you're going to start to get people that you don't, you're not used to working with. So I've been a developer all my life. I was an engineering leader at my company. And when I started to pick up new people, so I can tell you exactly what an engineering career looks like. I lived one. But if I get QA or security or operations on my team, they are completely different. They work differently. They are uh, motivated differently. You have to talk to them differently. And frankly, you have to learn their careers so that way you can give them career guidance because you don't want to force them and talk about it from an engineering perspective. Uh, so new skills, especially around the care and feeding of those people. And of course, as I picked up those new people, I had new responsibilities. So if I had quality on my team, now I'm not just responsible for making sure the product's written, but then it's tested. And then I get operations. I'm responsible for it operationally in production. From an individual point of view, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. There was even anger sometimes. We had some people leave the company through this transformation because it just wasn't, it wasn't what they wanted at the time. It's not where they saw their careers. Organizationally, they have the same problem, right? So they look up to a manager that no longer understands them, doesn't speak their language, didn't do the things that they did. Maybe there's a loss of respect that goes on with that. It's a process of change that you have to work them through. Uh, they have to learn new skills. So if you think about this from the size of the team, so a waterfall team, it's not uncommon to have 50 or more people on a waterfall team. We're moving to Agile, now it's 6 to 12. And most DevOps uh, methodologies that I've seen run on top of Agile as well, and that's what we do. So you have that very small team. You don't have room on the team for a team of DBAs and a team of security people and a team of quality people. You have to, like like doing a little startup, you have to learn each other's jobs so there's no single point of failure. And of course, 
with those new cross-functional learnings, there's no expectations on me as a person. So the process looked like this. Uh, very easy in the waterfall stage, you know, slow and, uh, and really the dinosaur actually is pretty good for that, but the bulk of the change is in Agile. Um, it was revolutionary when we went from waterfall to Agile and more evolutionary as we moved into DevOps because it's more of the same thing. There's more automation, there's you know, looking for waste. There are things that need to change, uh, but those things after you've done Agile feel pretty easy. So if you're in Waterfall right now and you want to go to DevOps, it's not a one-hop. I would say it's not a one-hop. The, the way to get there is to master Agile and then move on into DevOps. Uh, anyone know the Monty Python theory of dinosaurs? I love this one. And this is actually a pretty good crowd because I'm closer to Monty Python here. Uh, smaller at one end, much bigger in the middle, and smaller again on the other end. So technology-wise, in Waterfall, again, we're talking about projects that could take six, nine, a year, a uh, year and a half to, to do. If you have a job that sucks and you only do it once a year and it takes you a day or two, okay, well, I guess I'm going to do that every year or so. Uh, there's no reason economically for you to go through and automate your way out of it. So you do the hard things, that, the hard way. Right? This is the, the kind of downfall of, of what you're doing with Waterfall, is you never get to a place where you're actually adding a lot of value quickly because you keep doing these things the hard way. In Agile, you can't do that, especially if you talk about your sprints being two to four weeks, if you don't start to automate your way out of some problems. They're not repeatable. They're not, you can't drive them on demand. Uh, it requires people to do it. Uh, so it can only be done during working hours. That, all, those, all those problems add up. And once you get the DevOps, it's automate the world. If it can be automated, you should. There is no reason not to, no matter how much it costs you. So I'll gloss through this one quickly. Everyone knows what this, this looks like, right? So waterfall, uh, lots of paperwork, big specs, uh, time horizons that are just so far out that no human could actually get it right, and finding anything later in, in the cycle. So if you find something in quality that should have been caught in requirements, well, you've got to unwind that whole stack and walk all the way back through all those phases. It's horribly painful and wasteful, which is one of the reasons you never hit your schedules and you never come in on time. This is the way companies are typically set up or were when I started. Right? You get the quality silo and you get the architecture silo and the security silo. We're throwing things over the wall. It ends up in a train wreck. Um, it, it's just, it, it's so hard to get your job done. It, it doesn't, you don't feel good about anything because you get a bunch of stuff foisted on you and then you foist it on the next one down the line. When we started, our technology was old school. Um, anyone recognize this, Gantt charts? I mean, they ran the space program on these things and, and we were still using them. Um, lots of documentation and manual everything. Everything was manual. We had manual tests and manual deploys and schema changes. Security was the same. When did people test and how did they test? In those days, we didn't have tools that could automate our way out of this, so it was manual code reviews and it was pen testing. And you always did it at the wrong time. We didn't learn this lesson yet, so we'd do it at the end. Uh, it was mostly manual, so it took a lot of time and people and it was an unpredictable amount of work. So you've got this release candidate in your hand. And he's like, ready to go to production. Like, yeah, not so fast. You, I just found about a month worth of work for you. That never felt good. And that's part of the reasons why you never met your schedule. Because what you were driving to is you just squeak the development in and then hope that all the testing goes well. Really, the biggest problem that we were trying to get rid of with Waterfall was this. You missed the customer. The time horizons are so long, no one can be accurate about it. And by the way, by the time you get there, the customer wanted, wants something else, or you didn't hear them right, and you poured all this effort in to build this, and they're like, uh-uh, this is what I wanted. So in Agile, you're, you can pivot quickly, learn from your mistakes, and actually hit the customer where they are at the time. So that's one of the great things about Agile. The other thing from a teaming perspective, so take a look at this, this is a waterfall, right? We have all our silos and our handoffs in between. And one of the, one of the problems with this methodology is in the siloing 
is that once the person writes what they want to write, they're off writing something for another team or for the next release or what have you. So the, the continuity and understanding why you built something is, starts to get lost the farther down the line you get. So the developers get a flavor of it. It's like playing telephone. And then by the time it gets to QA, it's like, okay, I, I think I understand. By the time it gets to operation, they have no idea why you built it or how it was supposed to work. Same thing with uh, the development team. They build something, QA gets a pretty good idea about it, and operations just gets to see how it works, which, by the way, does not go back up the pipe. So the operation team is there, is like, well, here's how it's running. I, I don't know how you think it's supposed to run, but it's not doing that. When we broke down those first walls with Agile, typically in that Agile transformation, you're combining quality with developers, right? So when you do that now, and of course our product owner is on there, we do that, now we start to see that quality and product really get to understand why you're building something and how it gets built, but that backflow problem is still there, which is what we did with DevOps. Breaking down that last wall was critical that we have continuity across this, so the operations people can be in the room when you're talking about the feature idea, not the feature deployment. All right, so everyone knows this chart. Unfortunately, most of the customer that I see, this is where our security team is. They're on the outside, and they're fighting for budget. I heard this in Shannon's talk today. Hey, can we just fix the most important things? You know, here's a list of 100 things. Well, i got time for five. We start breaking down those silos, security way off there on the side. Again, uh, the technology was all manual. So I would draw this on a chart. We had lists of tests that we would run. This, this is all the tests we could run or that I wanted to run, and here's what we could afford. Uh, of course, I call that the testing Death Star. Uh, every time I drew it, it just kept bringing that to mind. Uh, also, as we were working on deployments, it started to look like this. When we were a small company, one product, yeah, it was five or six people that would do deployment or push nights. As the product started to grow, we were a multi-product, and we were uh, adding in more agile teams into the mix. Now, we didn't no one, no one person could know every product, so we started inviting more people to them. So at one point, we had like 25 people going to a, a dinner before we did our deployment night. And worse yet, we get into production, and well, when does production data look like the data that you tested against? Never. When does it work the first time? Almost never. So we would have these heroic efforts of our developers, were like you know, six weeks of, of work, and now we've got to go make this fix because, oops, it didn't behave the way I thought. They'd go run into their office, 10 minutes later, something would show up in source control, we'd build it, push it to production, and hopefully it worked. Not a great way to run an airline. Uh, security was also, um, especially when we started uh, automating this thing, uh, very manual. And a lot of problems that we're going to talk about here in a second. So developers come in, do work, check it in. We'd have a hardening sprint, so this is more like agile fall, right? So I did a bunch of work, and now I'm going to go through and do this. And this terrible thing would happen. I get security results, and now I get two backlogs. How do I report on that? How do I give that to my Agile team to say, hey, guys, this is the most important thing to work on? And as I'm reporting to my CISO and my development leaders, how do I tell them where we are in the release cycle? I can't. I'm trying to match these two things together, and this is a, one's a spreadsheet and one's my, my rally backlog. Plus, we're wasting time. So over here between three and four, someone pokes the build. Someone you know, pushes it up to scan it. There's a lot of waste there that can only happen when people are sitting at desks and they sit there and they don't really do anything else with their time while the computers do all the work. So we integrated and automated this. So developers come and get their work. Now, this part here I'm going to call preventative and educational. What I expect is that my developers are testing not only for functional requirements but non-functional requirements like security prior to check-in. Okay. This is how far left I want them to do this. Now, nightly, this is for our larger products, millions of lines of Java and JavaScript. Uh, so it takes an hour or so for us to get results back, not something I can put in a pipeline. So nightly, we do a build, we upload it, and then we synchronize it to backlog. Key point there, get it in the backlog. It has to be part of your triage cycles. So when the teams come in to talk about the work for the day, I want that in my triage meeting. So this isn't the only thing that we do as part of our security process. We do security champions and groomings, threat modeling, et cetera. I'm happy to talk to you about any about these, but uh, 
don't want to lose pace here. So if you see anything, any topics up there that you'd like to talk about, this is part of what we do when we release products. So we got this culture clash, right? And from Agile, where the developer's trying to move fast, but the, the operations guy's paid to keep everything nice and steady and smooth. So DevOps process, you guys have all seen this. At this point in DevOps, we broke down all of the silos. So the first one was moving quality over. At this point, we said, all right, enough of this. Let's reorganize everything and change the culture. And what that means is we were talking to our teams and our quality people and our developers, our security team, our operations people, everyone was on page duty. When I talk about DevOps teams, it's different than what other people have been talking about today. What I mean is a product team doing real DevOps, responsible from cradle to grave for the functionality that they built. Because think about how differently a developer is going to think about writing the code or quality is going to think about testing that code if they're the ones that are going to get woken up, right? I'm going to think a lot harder about the telemetry I put in and maybe some monitoring that I'm going to add because I'm the one that could get woken up by this. Some parts of this are still aspirational for us, but in general, this is the beat that we're marching to, right? It's all about automation. Um, it's about putting in feature switching, doing trunk-based development and trunk-based deploys. Um, we want to make sure that, uh, that we do a controlled roll-up. We want to be able to turn things off, things that aren't finished yet even. Go out into production, feature switched. This is the hardest one. Especially if you've been working on a product for a very long time, even a SaaS product, doing zero downtime upgrades after six or eight years of writing code, mm, boy, that's a tough one. Easy with Greenfield. So if you've got a Greenfield project, this would be one of my first goals, right? So as we talk about microservices, that's where I would be. Um, and single piece flow is something that still eludes us even in, my, in, in some of my teams. There is an agile, a water, uh, DevOps team, sorry, that uh, I'll talk about in a second that does that. But this is a hard one, you know, thinking about those sprint boundaries and accumulating change. So security guys, we don't want to look like this, right? We don't want to be blocking the, the bridge. So here's what we did. So this is a pipeline from my, one of my microservices. Got a backlog again. Developers come in and get their work. And again, we do our preventative and educational testing here. I expect everything down the line to be green. If it's not green, then someone wasn't following the process and someone wasn't doing their job. So at check-in now, and on every check-in, we're going to run a build, and I'm going to do static analysis side-by-side -side with my unit tests. These tests for small services like this run in minutes, about three or four minutes for this particular piece of code, out of which I get a result, which is, of course, the CI portion of your pipeline, right? This is my continuous integration. I'm going to run tests on it all the time that I expect to pass. If they don't, break the build. I synchronize the backlog, and off we go. Otherwise, I'm going to move one step closer to production. I'm going to move into a QA environment, then a staging environment, and then finally into my production environment. Once I have it deployed, I'm going to run testing. I'm going to run dynamic analysis, and I'm going to run regression testing. I'm in a working system now. Let's make sure that when we deploy this thing, it doesn't break. Again, I get a result out of these tests. I can move that to the next stage. So if it's a QA, it goes to stage. If it's stage, it goes to prod. All automatically lights out. It has to be based on tests that you trust. Right? This is the CD portion of the pipeline. So again, preventative and educational here. Everything else down the line is assurance. Did we do the right thing? Because if anything fails, I want to break and point out the fact that we didn't do our educational and preventative testing. Holistically, this is the way I think about an application security program. Tons of training. I've been doing this 25 years. When I was in college, they did not teach me how to write secure code. Even today, most universities do not have courses or degrees, for that matter, on how to write code securely. It's not the important thing. They think uh, they teach you big O and how to make big complex systems and multi-threading and all those other things. So you need to train them. It's part of the carrying cost of running an AppSec program and, and having developers in your company. Static analysis, thinking about not only the defects in your first party code, but also defects in your open source code. This is the place to find them early on when it's cheaper to fix. Right? So I shift that all the way left. The day they start writing code is the day I want to start doing this. Now, it requires tools, and there are tools, and some of the vendors are here, some are not, uh, that you can get a developer at their desktop and their IDE to get, get their results in seconds. 
that fits. It's like running unit tests. Why wouldn't you do it if you could, right? So we start there. We go on to more stateful analysis where I'm looking at the whole application. It's like uh, taking the test before the test. I want to make sure I pass. And as security professionals, you should be making sure that you've communicated those things to your development teams. Help them understand why the rules are there and how to think about them. Now, we're going to run dynamic analysis the second I have something I can deploy, right? Because that's a great time to do that. And I'm going to run that all the way into production. And th this was mentioned a couple times in here. This is largely for configuration drift. Typically, you're not terraforming and building your environments out of code. They're maintained by people and different people, by the way. So in, in uh, production, it's my IT and sysenge people. But in QA, it's QA people and developers. There's a wild west in there. So making sure that my configurations are proper all the way into production is critical. Uh, we, talk, we heard about RASP today. Now, the security team down the bottom here, huge role to play. Again, I want them shifting left, too. I need them in discussions around secure design uh, and, and doing reviews and security grooming to help them understand the things that they should be worried about before they write code, not after they write code. And in the middle, while they're developing, we want to get those, the feedback from the static, dynamic, any testing that you're going to do, help them fix what they find. The earlier you fix it, the cheaper it is, and the more they're going to learn. Good developers will learn this stuff over time, and in a couple of years, they will start writing it. It'll come out of their fingers secure if you're giving them good training and feedback, to uh, the, the point from this morning's uh, keynote. And there's room at the end for doing my man pen testing and my red team activities. Those are all valuable. But I, I'm more concerned about catching as much as I can, as cheap as I can, as far left as I can. Right? So this is the way I think about running a good AppSec program to be able to deploy very quickly into production. So the important part here is that this is the journey that I took my company on, right? my teams. Innovation, which is great, um, I think of this as revolutionary at the micro level. Don't take your company and dump it upside down on the table and decide we're going to do DevOps, so let's like reorient everybody. Have a small pilot project. If you have a greenfield project that's just starting, perfect place to start. Now, we didn't have that. I had a monolithic application. We figured it out. Um, if you have something to do like that, that's the perfect project to start on. Uh, and then evolve it to the rest of the company. Prove the value. Make the mistakes. Figure out what works in your culture. Because this is really the critical aspect. A lot of the things that I talked about, about breaking down the silos and things, those are going to take time, and you're going to have to nurse some wounds. And we had to ask some people to leave the company. People that said, you know what? I just do quality, or I'm just a development leader. I don't want to lead other functions. They're like, okay, sorry. That's not the role that we have for you today, so you're going to have to find something else. And some people left on their own. It's just they didn't want to be multifunctional. Continuous improvement. So this is a you know this is a DevOps thing. It's an agile thing as well. Um, as a team, we're always constructively dissatisfied with how we are and where we are. We always want to get better. Uh, think about that in, on your teams. Um, again, it's it's a it's about being better. I, I'm a soccer coach, a longtime soccer coach. The first day of practice for a new team, I tell them, look, when I'm when I'm correcting you and giving you instruction, you don't have to be bad to get better. It's not because I think you're terrible. It's because I think you have potential, and I want you to reach that potential. So we're going to do that as a team. So our journey continues. Again, the things that we struggle with today are largely around that single piece flow. Um, it's largely around saying, well, where does pen testing fit in? So one of the things that will come up is, in our grooming sessions, we'll talk about a feature, and it'll touch some critical control, or uh, it'll be something where the security champion says, ah, geez, we should really talk to research about this one. And we'll pull that aside for pen testing. So how do you think about that cycle of uh, CI, CD when you got pen testing in there? It can't be done that way. So we had to manufacture other ways of doing that. So prior to trunk check-in, we might put something into a branch. And in that branch, we'll put that aside and say, hey, pen tester, take as long as you want. I don't care because you're not holding up the works. Right? The work is the work. Let it take as long as it takes. I want this to be thorough. Once they approve it and we've, we're ready to go, it gets checked in the trunk, falls into that pipeline. So think about protecting your pipeline from all things manual. Find a way to do it before 
check-in, and again, that, for me, that means check-in to trunk, so if you do branching and those other things, that's a way to account for that. That's where we put those things, because what I want is a mean time to repair or a mean time to change production. I have a, a code change in hand. How long is it going to take me to deploy? I always know, because my pipeline runs the same every single time. I thank our sponsors. Uh, I am thrilled to be here, and I thank you for your time.